you wherever you come from we welcome you whomever you love we welcome you whomever you love we welcome you good morning Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Kent. I'm the Reverend Stephen Protzman, your minister. Thank you for joining us this morning as we gather virtually once again, a spiritual community that seeks to be diverse and inclusive as we inspire love, work for justice, and grow together in community. Wherever you are this morning, whoever you are, we welcome you. May this time together be filled with joy, with belonging, with hope, and with the promise of who we can be together. Once again, welcome this morning as we reflect on universalism and some of its history. Until I came to Unitarian Universalism, I did not see many examples of service or volunteerism in my family or my church. I grew up Catholic, attending my grandmother's church, St. Joan of Arc, in Streetsboro. In my limited experience with the church, my only knowledge of service was the Altar and Rosary Society, a group of women who essentially ran the entire church. They organized greeters, cleaned the church, planned food for funerals and baptisms, provided meals for the priest, ran the bingo kitchen, and on and on. Other than this small example, I had no other model of service before coming here. My family did not volunteer. It was just not part of our family tradition. I walked into these doors for the first time on May 1st, 2005. Within my first two to three weeks, I was asked to become a greeter, which I did. Three years later, I found myself as moderator of the board. It was quite a steep learning curve. Of course, we were much smaller then, 
but still. I'm glad it happened this way, however, because being on the board was such an amazing learning opportunity. Through my board service, I saw the big picture of the workings of the church and the larger denomination. I understood how all the committees function together to create the whole that keeps us moving forward. And I realized just how very many people it takes to make that happen. I am called to serve continually because of my commitment to making this beloved community the best place it can be. I want to share my gifts and talents with others. I want to learn about myself, about other members of this congregation, and about the community that we share. Service is a gift that gives in two directions. I feel that I've contributed to the greater good of this church, while at the same time I feel a sense of pride that I've given some small part of myself to others. In the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, the purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, and to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. We all have gifts to give. How are you called to serve? Come, let us worship together. We join Unitarian Universalists across the country in lighting a chalice. It's a sign of life's beauty and wonder, a symbol of peace and hope, an invitation to continue our ongoing search for the light of truth within us and among us, and a reminder that we are all interconnected in the great web of existence, which we are each a beloved part. As I light our shared chalice, I invite you to light your home chalice. Would you join me now in the words of our Congregational Covenant? We affirm that each life has brilliance, and when joined with others in joyful community, has the power to transform. We pledge ourselves and our resources to this journey. This covenant inspires and challenges us to dwell together in right relationship. We promise to extend hospitality, nurture community for all ages, encourage spiritual growth, honor diversity, and practice kindness. Our first reading this morning is from Bonnie Hurd Smith, An Awakening. John Murray was born in 1741 to an upper class Anglican family in Alton, England. John's childhood was dominated by his strict Calvinist father, whose fears for John's soul led him to beat and isolate his son. As a child, John perceived religion as a gloomy means to control people's behavior. John's father moved their family to Cork, Ireland when John was 11. In Cork, John encountered Methodists, whose more social musical gatherings were a welcome departure from what John had known of organized religion. The Methodists, led by John Wesley, were evangelicals, held religious revivals, and reached out to people from all walks of life in a radical departure from the more solemn Anglican tradition of John's earlier years. Wesley was also an important early role model, starting John on a path to ministry, and many Methodists predicted that he would become a burning, shining light. Meanwhile, a Methodist family in Cork, the Littles, had befriended John and encouraged him to read books in their extensive library, an exciting prospect because John's father had forbidden him to read anything but the Bible or approved religious texts. When John was 19, his father died and John accepted the Littles' invitation to live with them as one of their own children. Before long, the Littles encouraged John to marry their daughter, a prospect that did not interest him. John began to have doubts about John Wesley's theology and believed that there was a higher purpose for him. And believing there was a higher purpose for him, he decided to leave Ireland. As John later wrote, his grandmother told him, 
God has designed for you, has designed you for himself. You are a chosen instrument to give light to your fellow men. On his way to England, John spent a few weeks in Limerick where he heard a sermon by the itinerant evangelical Methodist preacher, George Whitefield. John admired the preacher's non-denominational welcoming style, which seemed more agreeable than Wesley's more rigid ministry. John eventually went to London where he quickly made friends and enjoyed that city's social life while he contemplated what sort of work to pursue. Before long, John ran out of the money he had received from the Littles and went to work in a textile factory. John despised his job, but in the evenings, his love for religion drove him to George Whitefield's tabernacle. After a short time, Whitefield asked John to preach at the tabernacle and his talent quickly became the subject of conversations in London. John fell in love with a young woman who came to hear him preach, Eliza Neal, and they eventually married despite her family's strong objections to their daughters marrying a Methodist. Like most of the other their Methodist friends, John and Eliza were well aware that James Relly, a Welsh preacher, a Welsh preacher was in London lecturing on universal salvation. As a good Methodist, John despised Relly and refused to hear him. He was even asked to save a young Methodist woman whom Relly had been asked, who had been able to temp, tempt away from the tabernacle. John was surprisingly ineffective. Her arguments were persuasive. Finally, John decided to read Relly's book, Union, or a treatise of the consanguity and affinity between Christ and his church. Relly's interpretation of the scriptures made sense to him. Soon after, John and Eliza heard James Relly preach, and they were both profoundly effective, affected. The veil was taken from my heart, John wrote in his autobiography. John had become a universalist. The Methodist expelled him from the tabernacle. The Winds of Change You never know what the wind will blow in or which way the wind will blow. The wind can change directions and maybe even change your life. It happened that way to John Murray. As a young man, John Murray had an excellent fortune blow his way. He had a fine education, a steady job, a loving wife, and a young son. Life was good. And then suddenly, everything changed. John Murray's wife and their son became sick, and they died. John lost his job. He lost all of his money and he was put in jail because he could not pay his bills. John was a very religious man, a universalist, who had even preached about a loving God. And now he was not so sure what he believed. He felt his life was over and friends urged him to go someplace. Perhaps he could start again. He sailed for America on a ship named the Hand in Hand and the wind blew the ship toward the colonies, their destination, New York. But then a fog rolled in and the ship ran aground in New, York, in New Jersey instead. John and a few others volunteered to leave the ship and go on land and get directions and supplies. And as he walked ashore, John saw a farmhouse with a small chapel beside it. It belonged to Thomas Potter. Thomas Potter greeted John, gave him food for him and everyone on the ship, and invited John to come back and have dinner with him that night. When John came back, Thomas Potter showed him the small chapel that he had built himself. He said to John he believed in a loving God who wanted to accept all people into heaven. John said that he believed the same. 
Thomas Potter told John that he had built this chapel and was waiting for God to send him a minister. You, John, are that minister. I have waited for you for a long time. John did not want to hear this. He was not a preacher anymore, and he was determined to never preach again. Yet Thomas Potter seemed confident that John was the universalist preacher that he had waited for, and he asked John to preach that Sunday. Oh, I cannot preach on Sunday, said John, because as soon as the wind changes, my boat will set sail and I must be on it. Well, if the boat has not sailed by Sunday, will you preach? asked Thomas Potter. If I'm still here on Sunday, I will preach, said John Murray. Now, what do you think happened? Did the wind blow? Did the hand in hand sail away, taking John Murray with it? No, nope. no wind blew, no ship sailed. And John Murray preached on Sunday morning, September 30th, 1770, almost exactly 250 years ago in the chapel that Thomas Potter built for him many years before. The universalist message of the power of love was good news to many who heard it. It was good news for John too. The winds of change blew yet again for John Murray. He now wanted to preach more than anything, and he did for many years, and he helped found universalism in America. He is one of the ancestors of our faith home, and we, as Unitarian Universalists, owe a special thanks to Thomas Potter. It was his hospitality that brought John Murray back to the pulpit, and we also owe a very special thanks to the wind, the wind that blew John Murray in and refused to blow him back out. John Murray sailed on the hand in hand and his ship got stuck on a bar of sand. Put on his boots and he reached dry land to preach the gospel of love, oh, love, oh, love, oh. He put on his boots and he reached dry land to preach the gospel of love, oh. Now Thomas Potter had a church built there, but still that church was bleak and bare. No preacher had come, despite his prayer, to preach the gospel of love, oh, love, oh, love, oh. No preacher had come, despite his prayer, to preach the gospel of love, oh. Thomas Potter offered her hospitality, so John Murray wouldn't go back to sea. He said, man, wouldn't you come and preach for me? Yeah, preach the gospel of love, oh, love, oh, love, oh. Man, wouldn't you come and preach for me? Yeah, preach the gospel of love, oh. John said the winds of change blowing hard and strong and I don't think I'm gonna be here that long but if I'm here on Sunday I'll come out strong and preach the gospel of love oh love oh love oh if I'm here on Sunday I'll come out strong and I'll preach the gospel of love oh so hand in hand stayed close by the shore John Murray couldn't walk or run away no more Thomas Potter's chapel flung wide the doors and they preach the gospel of love, oh, love, oh, love, oh. Thomas Potter's chapel flung wide the doors, and they preach the gospel of love, oh. Our second, third reading this morning comes from Helen, Co Helen Knox, Claiming and Reclaiming Universalism. I am only now beginning to appreciate the momentous implications of the fact that I am a universalist first and foremost. Yay, more, universalism liberates the individual soul. Unitarianism liberates the individual soul, but universalism makes demands for it, including the demand for spiritual growth. Universalism's ringing affirmations of optimism and equality are accompanied by a prophetic cry to liberate all so that they may be saved on earth as they already are in heaven. 
Affirming individual authority in religion, Unitarianism does not require us to believe in any particular doctrine, even the anti-Trinitarian concept of God that gave it its name. In the course of its evolution, universalism arrived at a non-creedal position also, but the whole weight of its heritage obliges us to believe in universal salvation, define that as you will, or it makes no sense to call ourselves universalists. Universalism makes other daunting demands. You must not lose hope. You must not give in to despair or emotional paralysis. Clinical depression can be redeemed not just by therapy, but by faith, a religious affirmation that life is good, worth living, even if you don't feel like it. You, do, you will not go to everlasting hell, but you must keep the spirit of life burning no matter what hell on earth you walk through or become aware of. You must have love and compassion not only for yourself, which strangely seems hardest of all, but also for everyone else, for animals, for the whole planet as an ecosystem, for the universe, finally. We still have a long way to go before we will be practicing what our name preaches. To be a universalist, you must counter, rather than contribute to, the racism, sexism, ageism, homophobia, and other pathologies of our society. Belief in universalism enables, a re enables relation and genuine tender contact. For to believe in universal salvation is to affirm the worth and dignity of every person. A radical principle undergirding universalist theology all the way from the gracious God of John Murray to the bold vision declared 75 years ago by Robert Cummins then General Superintendent of the Universalist Church of America, when he said, Universalism cannot be limited to either Protestantism or to Christianity, not without denying its very name. Ours is a world fellowship, just as not just a Christian sect. For so long as universalism is universalism and not partialism, the fellowship bearing its name must succeed in making it unmistakably clear that all are welcome. We are now beginning to fulfill this prophecy by building multicultural worship communities where the wide diversities among us are not just accepted, but celebrated, where the joys and sorrows of who we really are and are becoming can be expressed and shared we give each other strength to live the values of our universalist heritage in the great world. In the spirit of universalism, where the joys and sorrows of who we really are and are becoming can be expressed and shared, we take time to call to mind the joys and sorrows that come with living, to hold one another in the spirit of care and compassion, to turn inward for a few moments, to connect with the love that is the very heart of life itself, and to reflect on the mysteries of life. I offer this remembrance for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, written by my colleague, Luke Stevens Royer. As evening falls, so too does a pillar of love and justice. So does a fierce voice for the world we need. Yes, the grief is heavy. Yes, the uncertainty is like dense fog. And yes, like the dusk at the end of day, which remembers that in ancient traditions, dusk is the beginning of day, even a new year, we remember. A legacy cannot set with the sun. A lifetime or legal briefs and supreme rulings don't just fall in a moment. The work of a lifetime can break open and begin anew, even as darkness falls. May her spirit rise in our breath, in our voice, and in our vote. May our living and our action and our protection of her memory be as radical, bold, generative as Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We all carry joys and sorrows in our hearts and our minds this morning. I invite you to use the chat box to share your joys and concerns with one another now. 
Anne shares that he, she is thinking of Jen May's upcoming surgery. May that go well. Becky shares the joy that Marion Yeagler brings eggs every week and joy that her brother is out of ICU. Glad he's coming along. Kathy shares the sad news that Kevin's aunt Phyllis has died. She had been a special parent figure to him since his childhood. May Kevin find peace and comfort as he grieves and remembers her life. Brad shares the joy of seeing Claudia Miller back on her feet. Vivian shares the joy that construction of Hobbs Hall is moving along. It is. They are building foundation walls. Okay. Brad is thinking of Larry Cole, who should have returned from hospital by now. We'll share an update when we have one. Let's continue to hold Larry in our hearts. Thank you, everyone, for sharing these joys and concerns, things happening in your lives. 250 years ago, John Murray, his heart broken, arrived on these shores at the end of September, wanting to make a new life for himself. In his mind, he'd left the ministry behind. He'd sworn never to preach again, but love's power triumphed. After preaching that Sunday in Thomas Potter's chapel, Murray would become one of the founders of universalism in America. When Murray arrived, Calvinism was the dominant theology of the colonies. It was a harsh theology that damned most people to hell, while only the few elect would go to heaven. But universalism, a theology of love, dared to proclaim that all people were destined for heaven that salvation was not parsed out in a miserly way. Universalism became a wind blowing across America, the spirit of the enlightenment that was a breath of fresh air, driving out the dusty cobwebs and gloom of Calvinism. Universalism's message was so well received that at one point in the 19th century, it was the sixth largest American religion. Much has changed in the two and a half centuries since John Murray landed in New Jersey. The Unitarians and the Universalists consolidated to become the Unitarian Universalist Association. The language we use is modern, and we are a people of diverse theologies, beliefs, worldviews, and philosophies. Many of us do not believe in life after death. One thing has not changed, though the big love of universalism that is the heart of our faith, a love that ultimately wins, a love that is so broad, so deep, so ultimate, that no one is excluded and no one is beyond its embrace. My colleague, the Reverend Scott Alexander, describes universalism as a wild and welcoming doctrine, which can be summed up simply, there is a place set in this world for every last man, woman, child, every person. A precious, safe place has been set for each and every one of us, period. And it is our job as people to respect, protect, and nurture the well-being of everyone, of all. This is not an easy faith to have these days when there is so much suffering, cruelty, and evil in our world. But in the midst of all of this, our universalist heritage asks us to be courageous by believing in the worth and dignity of every person, and to not just believe, but to continue the work begun by our spiritual ancestors. Alexander goes on to say, universalism is a promise to theologically hang in there with the complexities and cruelties of the human enterprise. It is a promise not to give up on people but to keep struggling in our broken world for the improvement and inclusion of all. That struggle means you and I cannot sit back complacently. We must be bold. We must be audacious. We must speak and share and live the universalist message of love and hope. As John Murray was called by love, we are also called by that same love to share our unique gifts, our passions, and our love with one another and with the world. Today is Shared Ministry Sunday, an invitation to discover where your heart calls you to serve others and to serve the world. Each year, our membership committee hosts a Shared Ministries Fair. 
During this event, members and friends of the UU Church of Kent are introduced to numerous programs and ministries within our church community. It is hoped that everyone finds a place, a niche, a program, ministry, or social connection that speaks to them or feeds their soul. Since we cannot have our shared ministries fair in person this year, our membership team has put together an opportunities brochure, which is a list of the many ways available to participate in the life and work of this congregation and its ministries, both within our walls and out in the greater community. You may be already doing some of these things. If so, thank you. If not, I challenge and ask you to discover how you may be called to participate more fully in the work that love calls us to do to create heaven here on earth. In 1951, Alfred Cole imagined John Murray saying that we must go out into the highways and the byways, share our new vision of a world made fair, a people that is one, and a love that leaves no one out. We must give them not hell, but hope and courage. May it be so, and in the spirit of the love that makes all things possible, it is together we can make it so. Thank you, Vanessa. It is time to bring our worship to its close that we can take our love out into the world. Would you join me now in the words for extinguishing our chalice? We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. May we carry these in our hearts and minds until we are together again. These words, often attributed to John Murray, were actually written in 1951 by Alfred Cole, who imagined John Murray saying, you may possess only a small light, but uncover it, let it shine, use it in order to bring more light and understanding to the hearts and minds of people. 
Do not push them deeper into theological despair, but preach kindness and everlasting love. Give them not hell, but hope and courage. And now trusting in the abiding love that embraces and sustains all of us, and knowing that we each have gifts and love to share with the world, let us go forth in joy and hope to continue inspiring love, working for justice, and growing together in community. May it be so. Blessed be. Amen. Thank you.